On today's Locked on Thunder podcast, how have the expectations changed for Oklahoma City? We'll talk about that and more with Michael Martin on today's show. You are Locked on Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Lockdown Thunder podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, beat writer for InsideTheThunder.com, Ryland Styles. Follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunderpod. Email the show, LO Thunderpod at gmail.com. On today's show, we're joined by Michael Martin to discuss the Thunder at the All Star break. How have the expectations changed, the playoff rotations, matchups, and what to watch for in the second half? Michael, how are you doing today? Doing great. Ready for All-Star Weekend. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Cannot wait to be in Indiana for all the festivities. And you have something very special on your YouTube channel for those people to hold themselves over as we get a little bit of break in the NBA schedule without much to do in the NBA until after the weekend. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, I had a Chet video that came out a few weeks ago about his shot blocking, and now I have one about Jalen Williams and his um Great start to 2024, mainly in the fourth quarters, but just overall how he's been this season. That'll be a lot of fun. Go check that out, Michael, on sports and all social platforms, including on Twitter. Uh, But, Michael, the Thunder have been fantastic this season, frankly. Uh, They are going to be in the mix for the top seed in the West. And uh, right now, uh, they currently set a game back with a game to play until the All-Star break. How have the expectations changed compared to the start of the season, now as we enter what is the second half of the season unofficially, of course, not by the numbers, but we usually use the all-star break as a line of demarcation. How have expectations changed for you? Well, not to step on the toes of your point, because we previewed a little bit about this, but I had something similar in the sense of, I think some fans are getting a little um, uncomfortable with the idea of them falling to four or five or something like that, which is the reality is, if you said that in the preseason, every fan would have signed up, said you're the four or five seed, you have home court. That's great, but it feels like as the team keeps playing well and is at the top of the Western Conference, if they fall just even a little bit, it feels like there is some level of panic, even though this team is way ahead of schedule. Yeah, this team is so far ahead of schedule that whatever happens this year, barring some just horrendous collapse, is going to be an officially great season by every measurement. You look at where this team is at, and you mentioned it. Top of the conference is all just razor thin, separated by a game, a game and a half. You know, we'll see where the dust settles on Thursday. But the the home court, you know, this top four seats, to get down to five for these teams like the Nuggets, Clippers, Thunder, and Timberwolves, they have, you know, a, a five-game cushion on, on five. And they're, they are in prime position, those four teams are, to be the home court advantage team once the regular season is over. And I think that, you know, the expectation at the start of the year was, hey, if you can get into the top six and avoid the play-in tournament, that's a that's a great year. If you can be solidly in the play-in tournament and not worry about it at the end of the year and you're seven or eight, that's also really good. To be a home court advantage team is something that, you know, is out of the realm of possibility for even the wildest homers. You know, if you would have said that in on August 1st or October 1st, you would have been just picked apart for that approach and just viewed as just an obnoxious, you know, Thunder fan. But everything's broken right and it's all turned out the, the Thunder's way. That I look at the second half of the season and reevaluating where they're at maturity wise, reevaluating where they're at in terms of what they've been able to accomplish. I think that this Thunder team, a good goal for them in the second half and an expectation for them in the second half is. It doesn't matter where you finish one, two, three, or four, but manage that four game cushion, manage that five game cushion up on a home court advantage and make sure that you're hosting a playoff series, at least one um, in in the first round of the playoffs. Yeah, I'm with you, especially for a younger team and knowing the home court advantage that the Thunder have had historically. I think that's very, very important. You don't want to throw a lot of these guys out in their first playoff series on the road in a hostile environment. And the reality is with these top four teams, like you mentioned, with how razor thin the margins are, it's not like there's a Durant Warriors team that's hovering at number one that you're like, well, 
we got to play sort of the bracket here and make sure we face them in the conference finals. There's not a team like that. I mean, the Nuggets are still number one in my mind. I still think that they're kind of coasting. And once they get into the playoffs, they'll be the hardest team to beat in the West. But it's not a situation where you're like, well, we have to avoid them. I think that for this team, like you, we've already talked about, they're playing with a lot of house money and just getting to the second round and having a competitive series in my mind would be an absolute giant win. So I'm 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 with you. As long as they hold Pat and stand Pat in the top four, you'd want them to get the higher seed if you can. But home court is enough for me, no matter if it's one through four. Yeah, I think that's to be a great staple. And we kind of touched on it there about uh, expectations once the new season starts in the postseason. But come playoff time, I don't think that there's an absolute failure unless you just get like embarrassed or like swam out of a series, like you lose in four or five. If you even take the first round to six or seven and lose. I don't think that that's like a failure. Obviously, it would be a disappointment considering what they've been able to accomplish this year. But given the fact that there is no like team that is a clear runaway, like you mentioned, those Warriors teams were, and there is no team where it feels like the Thunder have to play uh, tremendously above their skis to beat. What do you view as the as the kind of kind of level of competition that Thunder can play in the postseason? I know that they're young. How much do you do you value? their inexperience mixed it with, you know, what we've seen so far this season against that trend. So just them trying to buck the trend of being a younger team and playing in some of these big games. Essentially. Right. How, how much do you kind of like put into, Oh, they're young. So they can't go in a couple series and go on a deep run versus this team has already kind of proven that they are already an anomaly for such a young team. I wouldn't say they can't do it. I'd say the odds are against them. That doesn't mean they can't do it. Like I think their ceiling right now is playing in a Western Conference Finals. Uh, beyond that, I just think that it's a lot to ask for a team this young. There's a reason why they bring up that Durant, Westbrook, Harden team that went to the finals. There aren't a lot of examples like it. That That's the one. So this would be an anomaly, and they've been an anomaly this season. But I think it's a big ask. And um, the reality is there are a lot of things in the playoffs that we just haven't seen. These guys have proven it somewhat in the regular season, but we haven't seen Shea as the number one guy on a scouting report in the playoffs where teams just say, you're not doing this or dub in a lot of situations the number two and Mark in a playoff series uh, really prepping for seven games or whatever it is. That doesn't mean that I'm doubting these guys, but it is just a whole different animal compared to the regular season. And then going back to something you said about disaster i mean the only way that it would be a disaster is if the guys look totally unready uh, and underqualified and unprepared and it's something like the pelicans and the blazers from a few years ago where the blazers looked like they were just going to take it and then the pelicans just swept them but that's about it i can think of that's going to be we'd be here and be like oh what are they going to do next yeah so i, I think that with this thunder team i, I would agree that the, the situation is going to change in the postseason a big point that I would would wholeheartedly want to expand on that you made about Mark preparing for a, a, a playoff series. Mark's been very clear the last couple of years that you know the preparation you do game to game in the NBA for the 82 game season is way more focused internally than externally. And I believe that that's the case for the majority of NBA teams to where even that aspect of it, like you mentioned, preparing for the Thunder, much less than preparing for someone else, is totally different whenever you get to zero in on one team for the length of a seven game series and make adjustments in those series. I believe that Mark will be able to handle that. I think that the thunder will be able to handle that, but that is an obstacle in their way that isn't prevalent in the regular season as much because you're, you are more worried about your internal stuff most of the time. Now with the, with the players, I think that um, on one hand, you know, I've been saying it's kind of silly to, to think that on April 1st, the thunder are not going to be able to play good basketball, uh, but it, it is different in terms of the basketball um, kind of strategies and playing more in the half court for a team that loves to force turnovers and play out in transition. All that is changing. What I would say the expectation is for the postseason would be compete in a seven game series or better, uh, you know, in the first round, I think they can get out of the first round and we can talk about playoff matchups and playoff rotations. I don't think that the expectation should be that they'll get to the conference finals or they'll go to the NBA finals. I also think that that's off the table though. That, that's the beauty of it, but expectation level of what they should do they should take a six, seven game series um, in the first round at, the, at a bare minimum. And I think that whenever we're going to talk about kind of their matchups, that is that is a fair, fair, fair assessment of, of this roster so far. Yeah, I'm with you. I think that as long as there's a competitive first round series, I think that's all you can ask for. I mean, it might be a little bit, a bit disheartening if it's a team that fans feel like they're ahead of already in terms of maybe like the Kings or the Pelicans. But 
other than that, if they play a really solid series and there's things that we can build on as we go into the summer talking about this team, I don't think there can be too many complaints. They're they're still very early and way ahead of schedule, as we've mentioned. So let's continue on talking about you know playoff matchups that would favor the Thunder and also matchups where uh, it kind of change your your view because a lot of this is going to be matchup dependent. Plus, what will the playoff rotations look like for Oklahoma City all coming up? But first, I want to say right now, but good friends over at Robinhood, check out Robinhood right now uh, because they're awesome. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA. Robinhood is the only IRA that gives you 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. So get this, right now through April 30th, Robinhood is going to boost every single dollar that you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right. No cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets the most for your retirement thanks to the IRA with 3% match. They offer uh, The offer is as good through April 30th. Get started today at Robinhood.com slash boost. Uh, subscription fees apply. And now, for some legal info, claim as of Q1 2024, valid by Radius Global Marketing Research invested involves risk, including loss, and limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. The 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year. From the data of the first 3% match, must keep Robinhood for five years and 3% matching on transfer, just subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA is available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC, member SDIP, registration, broker, dealer. Make sure you check it out today at Robinhood. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. I'm your host, Ryland Styles. Joined today is Michael Martin, at Michael on Sports, on all social platforms, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, everything else. Now, we've talked about the expectations changing from the All-Star break. I, I think that we can both agree that like home court advantage would be a massively good goal for the Thunder, especially compared to the preseason. Talked about the postseason a little bit. Let's dive more into that. Again, I think that you know you can only expect them to do a, a, a solid first-round series, but there's also, in turn, no cap on them as we look through the standings and look at some more favorable matchups. As you look at the standings right now, who would you say that's the team that I would circle for the Thunder of wanting them to play? And who would be the immediate team where you just want no parts of for the Thunder in an obviously very competitive West where there's no just cakewalk? Starting with the team that I would want the most, just given their age and sort of how they match up with the team, is the Warriors. I mean, they're still in and out of that play in mix. So, they're probably a team that unless you obviously get to the one, two spot that you're probably not going to get to play. I think the the Kings are a fun matchup. Um, we just saw the Thunder beat them. I think that Chet has figured out a lot more about Sabonis and how to play his matchup. And then as far as teams that, or if you want to go first, I can let you do that before I get to the, the tougher teams. Yeah. So I think that whenever you look at this, this kind of layout, obviously there's no, no series. I don't think in the, in the West where you just think that it would be a boat race for the Thunder or for the opposite side either. I think this is going to be a very competitive postseason and one that I, I cannot wait to watch unfold. I like what we've seen uh, from you saying the Warriors because of what we've seen this season. We've seen the Thunder uh, handle Warriors in, in a in a high-pressurized environment, going to overtime on the road, playing nail-biting games down the stretch, and also we've seen them you know handle the Warriors whenever the Warriors weren't having a good night. But the fact that this team has already shown that they can handle those avalanche moments from Golden State. I don't think that they have very many of them uh, left in, in their system because of their age, because of um, what they've shown to this point in the regular season. Obviously, they're going to turn it on the postseason. They're going to have a game or two in the postseason where it's old school Warriors and the crowd's into it and they're knocking down threes. But other than the entire body of work, this Thunder team, despite their age, I think is emotionally able to handle that. So I would have to agree about the Warriors. And then as far as toughest teams, it's just going to be the teams at the top of the West. It's not very fun to say, but it's the other top four seeds between the Wolves, the Nuggets, and the Clippers, who all just have their own unique matchup problems. The Clippers can kind of neutralize small ball with just how many big wings they have and their versatility. The uh, Nuggets do it in a different way because it's hard to play small ball against the best player in the world. And then the Wolves are just obviously this ginormous team who kills you on the boards. That's not to say that the Thunder wouldn't have a chance, as we've talked about and preached here for a while, is that any of these series could go either way, but they're the ones who I envision giving Oklahoma City the most trouble. What do you think? 
Yeah, so clearly you have to agree with that. It's the, it's the top four teams for a reason. And again, they, they all have that kind of four-game cushion on the rest of the West. So for as good as the West has been, these teams so far have separated themselves as much as you can in a very tough West. For the sake of presenting another aspect, I'm going to say the Dallas Mavericks. I, I, I Not just because of the Saturday game, but because of what Luka is in the playoffs. You talk about how the playoffs are different and how players react differently and perform differently. Luka has proven every step of the way even, even beginning in the bubble, that he is just a different load to handle come postseason time and come playoff series, and he can just change them on a dime. You've seen Kyrie hit big shots in the playoffs, and if P.J. Washington and if Daniel Gaffer are as good as they've shown to this point for that team to kind of round out their roster, you give Luka any sort of help and any healthy help, I'm going to pick Luka more often than not, and so uh, I think that the dangers of that, especially in a very loud, raucous AAC, and the, the playoff feel will be so, I think, overwhelming for each team because those fan bases are going to travel back and forth down I-40 and, and figure it out uh, to, to pack each arena. I just, I would be kind of against playing Luka in any playoff format, honestly. Yeah, I'm not leaning towards playing Luka by any means either. And the thing is, with superstar players, we know they can affect the games in different ways. It's not just offense, defense, rebounding, shooting, whatever. Luca does a great job of doing with pace, and we see guys like LeBron do it, Steph, Russ in his prime. And you're just going to play at Luca's pace. He's going to slow it down. The Thunder aren't going to play at the pace that they have this season of just getting up and down. And you are going to play 48 minutes, basically, of half court basketball against Luca. And he's the ultimate chess master at that right now, where he controls all the other pieces on the roster. So, yeah, I, I still think the other three teams I would fear a little bit more, but by no means am I going, let me face that guy. You're muted right now. Thank you. I look at I look at Dallas in these playoff series, and, and I, I see, you know, the path to winning a playoff series is four games. You got to win four. How do you win those four out of seven? Well, Luca, as you saw on Saturday in the whole Mavericks team right now, they can have just nights where there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, th yes, the, the Thunder down the stretch of that game played terrible defense and did not have the energy. But at the beginning of the game, to demoralize them, the, the Mavericks hit very tough shots, including Luka Doncic, where you know Lou Dort was falling in his, in his lap and he just still cashed in threes. He's going to have a game or two like that in that series. And the Mavericks role players are going to have a game or two where they just cannot miss from three. That's already one strike against you. And then if both teams play their A game, the edge can go to either side and Luca is going to get his at some point. That's two games right there. So if you have any, you don't have that much room for error when you play guys the caliber of Luka Doncic. And so that's why I just would not kind of line them in a, in a playoff series that, uh, you know, the Warriors, even though they have the more flashier names and, and there's kind of that PTSD feeling of what it was like uh, facing the Warriors in the playoffs before, that's why I'd, I'd even have them uh, above uh, above Dallas on the list of of who you'd want to have play, you know, playing against them. Now, for the playoff rotation, the Thunder have so many different aspects that they can hit you with in the postseason with this roster. What would be, let's, let's start this, what would be your overall, like, generic playoff game, these are the players who should be playing, regardless of kind of the situation, then we'll get into more situational aspects of it. Okay, so I had seven guys for sure, one on the bubble, and then three that are situational. The seven for sure are Shea, Dub, Chet, Gordon Hayward, Dort, Isaiah Joe, and Kenrich. I think those guys can play against any team. On the bubble is Kaysen only because of his youth. I don't think he just like gets played off the floor in any series, but you know, it's it's hard for rookies in a lot of these bigger games. And you know, Chet has a lot more big game experience just being a number two pick and playing in some games in Gonzaga and whatever. And then on the uh in matchup dependent, I have Wiggins, Giddy, and Jay Will. Just because if they play somebody like the Wolves, you're going to see a lot more Jay Will. If you play against somebody like the Clippers, you're going to see a lot more Wiggins. You're going to play a lot more small ball. But I think the ironclad, like solid, written in stone guys that are going to be playing in the playoffs for sure, major minutes are Dub, Shea, Chet, Hayward, Dort, Joe, and Kenrich. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think that you know, outside of the starting five, you're going to have to play Isaiah Joe every single night. Uh, you're going to have to play Hayward, you know, as, as long as he's healthy, you're going to play him every single night uh, to provide that scoring punch. I, we've both been huge fans of Wiggins. You have to include him. That's already up to eight names right there before you even kind of move forward past those those names. Now, Josh Giddy can can obviously see massive minute reductions in the postseason. I mean, even against Sacramento, where things were, were heading pretty well for the Thunder for the majority of the game, he plays only 20 minutes in that contest. So 
Um, you know, he is in that eight, but he's not really uh, a, a massive minutes eater for the center team as of this moment. Uh, so where I kind of have the line at it for kind of your bubble would be more so in the three backup bigs. I love Kenneth Williams. There's also been moments this year where he's looked like an old 30 year old, similar to how we've talked about, you know, Steven Adams looking like an old, Oh, I can't believe he's only this year's old, you know, with, with Steven Adams, Kenrich at times looks a little bit beat up uh, to where, you know, you want to manage his minutes, I believe from now until the end of the season to, to allow him to maximize what, you know, what he can provide in the postseason. but between Kenrich J will. And then what do you think of Bismack Biombo as an addition to this team for, as a playoff tool? I think he's going to be sort of break in case of emergency or maybe something that's where Jay will looks a little bit overwhelmed or maybe he's need some fouls against a guy like Gobert. I think that if Biombo is playing extended minutes, no offense to him, I think something bad has happened. So I think that he has, he can have a role on this team. He can be a lob threat. He can be somebody who just dives at the rim, who blocks some shots, plays some drop coverage and does some, a lot of things. I think more than anything, he's insurance and you hope that he's somebody who just, doesn't hurt you, but just stabilizes things. Yeah, I, I, I've I've do not think that he'll be a fixture of the rotation. I do not think that that he will be someone who um, demands a ton of minutes or or anything. But as you mentioned, break glass in case of emergency. The playoffs are so crazy because you look at what the Mavericks did against the Clippers, where they put out Boban against the Clippers, and it works. And like the, mm -hmm. they just threw a wrench and everything. And it, and when you really break down the playoffs, each possession matters and each segment of game matters. So. If you win, you know, a five minute stretch, that's huge in a 48 minute game. And whenever you need to win four games out of seven. So uh, I, I think that he can be something like that, where he in in a way contributes. You're never going to forget those bow on contributions. If you're a Mavericks fan, if you're someone who followed that series, but at the end of the day, it, it's not as though uh, it was the end all be all type of thing for him. So I, I would totally agree that Biombo will not, I don't think have an allotted minutes toward him, but, uh, in a game where you need to change your pace and a game where you need more strength or more size or whatever, it's always better to have the option to have uh, someone like that than to just have to throw your hands up and kind of live with it. That's the exact thing that we talked about during the deadline is just giving yourself some options. And the reality is with these playoff series, they are series. So it's sort of each individual matchup in itself. So there are different playoff runs with different title teams where a guy is a big part of the first round and then not really in the second round. And then he comes back in the third round and he's a big part of the team. So Biombo might be a guy who let's say they get to the second round, they play against a team where he is more useful and he gets a lot more minutes than that, but he's more of a DNP in the first round, but at least you have that option, which is the thing that we're hitting on the most. So coming up, what to watch for in the second half of the season, what questions must still be answered, and what will we learn about the Thunder the rest of the way? But first, I want to say right now, our good friends over at Hungry Root, check them out today because, you know, whenever you look at, you know, Hungry Root and you look at um, just meal prepping as a whole, you're going to want to get the most bang for your buck, and that's what Hungry Root can do. The ordering process is super Super easy because grocery shopping and meal prepping uh, for specific dietary needs and preferences can be a bit of a challenge, can be a little overwhelming at times whenever you walk into the grocery store and want to figure out what you need and what what has what ingredients and what has what you know formulas. And so if this applies to you or someone that you know, make sure that you uh, check out Hungry Root because Hungry Root can help get what you need for all of your uh, dietary restrictions. Plus, customers can save five hours per week using Hungry Root without the stress of grocery and meal prepping. You can save money as well because Hungry Root is able to get you what you need by saving up to 30% um, of, of food waste, but also saving you some cold, hard cash at grocery stores, uh, you know, from, from buying from Hungry Root instead. With this special discount, they have 40% off of free veggies for life as well from Hungry Root. So check them out today because they're partnered with uh, you and healthy living. Uh, it's the easiest way to get fresh, high quality groceries. And it's a simple, healthy uh, delivery option for you uh, to make sure that you have your meals prepped and ready to go and eliminate that food waste, save hours of planning, shopping, and cooking. Hungry Root delivers food that you'll love right to you. Right now, Hungry Root is offering Lockdown NBA listeners 40% off of your first delivery and free veggies for life by going to hungryroot.com slash locked on. That's hungryroot.com slash locked on to get 40% off your first delivery and get your free veggies. Don't forget to use our link so that way they know that we sent you at hungryroot.com slash locked on. 
We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Check out Lockdown Sports Today, a 24-hour streaming channel of all the biggest news and notes of all the major sports leagues. Joined today by Michael Martin. And Michael, it's the second half of the season by way of a benchmark, not necessarily the 41-game mark, but what are you most looking forward to in the second half? This can Let's start specifically with the Thunder, then you can also transition into the NBA as a whole. How does Mark handle Gordon Hayward's minutes? Because you just mentioned with Ken Rich about saving him for the playoffs. Gordon Hayward has a history of injuries that doesn't really need to be gone over. I think we all know. And how do they ramp him up? Do they save him? And then who who is he playing with? Is he going to be in those uh, minutes in the first quarter and in the third with uh, Shea? Or is he going to be in now a trio with Chet and Dub? So I'm just really interested to see how they deploy him and the roles Mark puts him in and how, you know, reluctant or cautious they are if mark just throws them in the deep end it's like we need as much chemistry as possible we got to microwave this we got to see how these guys gel together or if they're more patient and say we have the long term of the playoffs in mind so we think this will work more than anything we just need you healthy yeah i i totally agree that i think that this can uh you know be something that will be a focal point and a big talking point for the rest of the season and into the playoffs and you know there's going to be talk about starting him and, and changing the starting lineup I don't think that the starting lineup is going to change. I think that you could see the minute allocation change. The Thunder have not been shy about benching Josh Giddey down the stretch of games, even dating back to last season, uh, benching Josh Giddey down the stretch of games. Uh, and now they have an even better roster to do so. So for me, the lineup's not going to change in terms of the first five, but the closing lineup certainly will. What is your thoughts on just that overall handlement of Gordon Hayward? That's just one of those stress things that the fan base is getting into that I just can't really put too much thought into until we get closer to the playoffs. Like you mentioned, it's it's more important who finishes the games than who starts it. And I think Gordon Hayward is going to be a staple a lot of of a lot of those um, end of game rotations and lineups because he just has so much versatility and a lot of experience. But I'm very excited to see how Mark uh, works with him. And whenever I mention those minutes with Shea versus the ones with Dub and Chet. I'm assuming he's going to come off the bench as you are. It's just a matter of, you know, where he fits into some of those rotations because we know so far this season, Mark loves to stagger those guys. When you when you look at the second half, what is a question you think still has to be answered besides, you know, Gordon Hayward? When does Mark start shrinking the rotation? Like we just talked about the rotation and we talked about nine, 10 guys. We were not getting into 13, 14, 15, which sometimes you see with Mark. Last year in the play-in uh, against the Pelicans, they played nine guys, 12 against the Wolves, which sort of caveat is that, you know, that game got out of hand a little bit fast, so that's a little bit different. In the month of January, they've played an average of 12 guys. They've only played single-digit guys once, but keep in mind that was um, against the Wizards coming off two losses to Atlanta and to Brooklyn, so that was one they really, really wanted. So I'm just interested to see how Mark sort of, as they rev up for the playoffs, how minutes increase and how he kind of like, I don't know, doesn't show his hand, but kind of tests out the waters on here are the main guys I want to be playing in this rotation come playoff time. So I think that that's a great question to be asked. I think that also a question that has to be asked would be uh, continuing to evaluate Josh Giddey's fit with this roster and Josh Giddey's fit with this team. Uh, I think that against Sacramento, it looked better. Um, the box score was not better. The the, the shot at the side of the backboard was not better but using him more as a screener and a cutter was better uh, as you do that more for him. Um, can he eventually become efficient as a score in that way? Uh, and can he find his groove as a 21 year old who's had to change his role three times already in the NBA and is now kind of not getting to, to play to the, to the maximization of his skill set of, of not being on ball a ton. What does that look like for the next 30 games and then into the postseason especially? I'd like to see him, you mentioned, as a screener. Um, if he can get the floater game going back a little bit more, this would really help. But just using him as a screener who rolls and does the short roll Draymond thing, and then you have Gordon Hayward on the outside, Chet and J-Dub and Shays on the perimeter, they're going to have to double the ball probably out of Shays' hands. And then you're on the four-on-three scenario that uh, Golden State's been eating on for years. And if he can get that floater going just at a normal rate that he normally is at, I think that's something that's very sustainable and very good for the offense and then defensively um and just all other aspects the shooting is what it is and it's been sort of just dis- it's gone up this year but it's not where fans want it and um i just need to see him more chip in on the little things because you can't really control when your shot's going to go in 
how much he's going to have the ball, but what you can control is effort on the boards and defensively. And those are the things I'd like to see him very much sharpen up. We saw a lot of that same rebounding stuff against New Orleans in the play in last year. So we know it ha- he has it in him. It's just a matter of, can he bring it to the table this year? I agree. I think that um, with Josh Giddy, obviously it's going to be a very you know, polarizing conversation, but it's one that, that is going to have to be had the entire rest of the year and beyond uh, that all the way into the summertime. Uh, you know, I think that from the NBA side of things, there's a ton of different things to watch because it is so close in all of these races. What what stands out the most to you that you're watching for NBA wide? It can tie back into the Thunder or just be just a, an NBA observation as a whole. Who gets hot at the right time? We saw the Mavericks a few years ago when they made the conference finals. They got hot at the right time. And that's that's a lot of this stuff. Who hits their stride right when you get into the playoff mix, right when you're at that time? The Lakers hit a big surge last year. So who is going to be able to ride the wave through the postseason and sort of just keep that going? So I think that's going to be interesting. And then knock on wood, we don't hope anything happens, but history says it does of who has the most impactful injury. You know, there are just so many guys, your Kawhi's, your Paul George's, your Steph's, your Durant's, your LeBron's, these older guys who have tons of miles on them and it feels almost inevitable. And those things almost always change the brackets and just how we go about these playoffs. So I'm interested to see who that'll be. Yeah, I think that that's a great one. I think that um, watching Milwaukee with Doc Rivers jail will be fun to, to observe. And then watching the bottom of this play in race uh, I, I, for the West. I don't, I don't necessarily know what Utah wants to accomplish, but they do have a very fun team and, and, and one that I think could be in the play in Houston, of course, has been gunning for a play in. And right now there it's looking uh, less and less optimistic, but still a possibility. Where does this all fall out? And of course, LeBron and the Lakers are going to be a big storyline as as uh, as they didn't make a move at the deadline, but did bring in Spencer Dinwiddie on the buyout market. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to talk a lot more about the NBA, about the Thunder, the second half of the year. Uh, but we ha- we always do this at home games, and we give these bold predictions uh, that rarely ever come true. Bold prediction for All Star Weekend. What is it? Bold prediction for All Star Weekend. Um. We get fourth quarter dub in the the Rising Stars Challenge games. I think that there's we get at least one down the stretch, really big clutch moments. He hits the three, he does the thing, all that stuff. I, I think we've seen an appearance from him where he uh, helps his team close out a game. Big time game from J Dub on Friday night. For my prediction, you got to wait till Sunday, but not too long on Sunday because Darius Baisley has a triple double in the G League next up game. That's my. That's my uh, prediction for All Star Weekend. That's bold. It's uh, off the board. Um, yeah, you you bet on somebody who uh, nobody really was going against. I think the right now our bookies are searching uh, furiously to find what the odds are. But um, if that hits, all all credit to you. I'm I'd be very surprised, but it is very Ryland Styles of you to uh, pick Darius Baisley and something like this. Shout out Darius Baisley. Shout out Keontae Johnson in the uh, in the next up game as well in the G League. And then, of course, you have Shea in the All-Star. You have J-Dub and Chet in Rising Stars and Case and Wallace as well in Rising Stars. It's going to be a fun weekend for Thunder fans, and they're going to be the talk of the town uh, here in Indianapolis. So, Michael, let them know what you got cooking, what you got out there for them to go enjoy uh, and start their weekend. Well, as Rylan has graciously uh, promoted for me at Michael on Sports on Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok. TikTok, I'm just trying to test out, but YouTube, more importantly, right now is where you're going to find this next J Dub video, The King in the Fourth, where it's just talking about his clutch numbers and how good he's been to start 2024. I'm very, very excited for that one. And then just um, a lot of uh, podcasting, a lot of Thunder talk, and um, hanging out with Rylan. So it should be fun. Should be a lot of fun. So for Michael Martin, I'm Rylan Styles. Until tomorrow, be good and be good to one another.